Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bleeding Effect, a podcast where we venture back in time through Assassin's Creed history. Lean back into the animus and join us. I am your host, Jarrett. And I'm Tiffany. Okay. Uh, it's nice to see you guys again. Or, <laughs> not to see you, but to, nice to be back, you guys. Um, we are starting off episode nine. So, um, there's some unforeseeable events. We actually lost the recap from last time. Uh, so... But I have my notes, so I can do a recap of what we went over last time, in last episode. So, last episode, that was the beginning of February, I think. Should have been the beginning of February. So, last episode, we actually, we, uh, we had just gotten back our recruits, or back to our recruits. We... We basically, we just started recruiting people for the cause, and we put them into action. I believe the episode previous, we had just gotten some recruits. In this episode, we started off by putting them to action. There were two uh, Templar agents, one named Malfato, who was like a plague doctor who liked to cut the throats of prostitutes. We had our recruits take him out. And then we had another guy named uh, Silvestro Sabatini, and we had to, he was a human trafficker. He kidnapped this kid's mom. We had to go rescue her and other kidnapped victims uh, from, I think it was the Trajan Ruins. We also um, ran into Leonardo uh, again. We found out what's been going on with him and how he's been uh, cooking up devices for uh, uh, Cesare and the Borgia against his will. Uh, and he also, he told us where we could find the blueprints for these devices and where we'd have to go to destroy them. So we, and we also got the double blade back. Um, he was able to fix that, repair that for us, since he's the only mastermind that can work on these kind of things. Uh, the first of his machines we got to destroy, it was a machine gun <coughs> attached to the back of a carriage, which, you know, almost blew us to pieces, but we managed to blow it up. Ezio managed to blow it up. We met back up with uh, with the uh, fellow assassins and uh, constructed a plan, you know, right after rescuing uh, what was her? Katarina Sforza. Right after rescuing Katarina Sforza, um, that's when we started doing the recruits and going on these missions. We reconvened back, and we have another plan on how to further weaken Cesare. Um, all of the guild members will, um, guild leaders will gather info throughout the city. Uh, Claudia will gather intel through the brothel. Uh, Volpe will gather info through his thief spies and, uh, and I think, well, uh, Bartolomeo controls the uh, controls the mercenary, so he'll basically be battling off the French, and he's going to try to weaken uh, Cesare's French allies. So they all have their missions, and then unfortunately, uh, Ezio has to say goodbye to Katarina. I'm sorry, it's a very long recap. Almost done now, but we got up to a point where uh, Claudia had gathered intel on a senator who owed money to this mysterious banker, and the reason they had to track down the banker is because he's the one who finances Cesare's uh, uh, battle strategies, basically finances his war campaign on conquering Italy. So we have to take out, take out the banker before we can take down Cesare. He's the money behind everything. Um, the senator's name was Egidio Troche. Uh, his brother was... His brother is like a servant to Cesare directly. But um, he doesn't like the Borgia. But he's kind of become one of their victims, and they're kind of just trying to... Uh, they have him in debt because he's been... racked up several gambling debts and everything, and he owes the banker money. So Etsy is going to help him pay back the banker in order to get gain an audience with the banker and find out who he is. So that's pretty much where we left off at. By the way, I just found my notes. <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, oh, look at that. There they are. Well, Whoops. then they should match up with what I just said. Yes, what okay. he said. Okay. So starting off, we're on episode nine. 
we have just given uh, Egidio the money to take to the banker. All right, the mission that we are starting on is called... Uh, actually, I didn't get the mission name. How about that? Mystery mission. I could look it up, but we're out of time. Um, so the mission is, description is simple. Follow the senator as he delivers his payment to the banker. For full sync, do not be detected and do not touch the ground while tailing the senator. So Ezio leaves the Chamberlain's villa, uh, the Chamberlain being a GDO's brother, and he goes to the meeting spot where the banker's men are uh, awaiting him. Uh, Ezio watches from a nearby rooftop. And guard one says, Egidio, it seems you are ready to die like a gentleman. And Egidio replies, I have the money. The guard says, oh, that's different then. The banker will be pleased. You came alone? Egidio replies, do you see anyone else here? Ezio, of course, is hiding in the shadows. It's like, okay, follow me, uh, Furbacione, which means wise ass in Italian. They make their way to the banker's location, and Ezio follows along unseen. Egidio says, Have you heard anything about my brother, Francesco? Uh, the guard says, Cesare is dealing with him. Egidio replies, I hope he is all right. So what are you going to do with my money? The guard says, The banker likes to treat his friends well. And Egidio says, sarcastically, How generous he is. And the guard says, what did you say? And Julia's like, oh, nothing. Um, Ezio follows them on their route uh, to meet with the banker. Uh, and their, their path takes them now to the Pantheon, which is the historical Pantheon located in Rome, housing several things. I don't, you know more about the Pantheon, right? Mm-hmm. That is the building that we're approaching now. So the building that we are approaching is absolutely gorgeous, by the way. <laughs> but uh, so the Pantheon is this huge structure that is located in Rome. It's a, actually an ancient Roman temple that was most famously re redone. Uh, the re sorry, so it was made originally in ancient Rome, and it was a typical temple for its period of time. But then it was redone, and a 143-foot dome was added on during the reign of Emperor Hadrian. And it's one of like the most impressive features about it, and one of the most uh, biggest mysteries about how this building was created because they're still not quite sure how this dome came to be with the technology that they had at that point in time. The dome features an oculus or a circular cutout in the top center of the structure that allows light to shine through and it has stood for over 2,000 years and like I said historians are not fully have not fully understood how the structure of such a heavy mass of concrete was able to be built with the Roman technology of the day or how the heck it's still standing today. Because if you look at it, it's this huge block building with this massive dome sitting on top of it, and it's all made out of concrete. And it has very reinforced walls to help hold up this sheer weight, but it's truly like an impressive building. And it does still stand today. Um, in 609, the temple was converted into a church known as the Church of Santa Maria Rotondum. Um, but a lot of the original stu structure and design still remains, so you can still very much see, like, if you look at it, it looks like a Roman temple. So as a pantheon, does it have, like, the entire pantheon of God, like, statues? Yeah, it? so it's not, it wasn't a, a temple that was made just for one God. Like, it wasn't just for Zeus or just for Poseidon. It was made for a collection or a pantheon of gods. So, yeah, that's where we, I think we get the term pantheon when we talk about different, like, mythologies and how they have, like, a whole family of gods. We refer to them as the pantheon, like the Norse pantheon, the Greek pantheon, the Egyptian pantheon, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um... It's a all de well. I was going to what's, say like all denominational, but no, it's not quite. I know you hate me for asking, but what's the difference between the Pantheon and the Parthenon? The Parthenon. So the name of the Parthenon comes from like the actual location that it's located on, which is a high place, and the Parthenon was specifically made for Athena. Okay, so the Parthenon is in Athens. The Pantheon is in Rome. Yeah. Okay, got it. And okay. it's located, like, on top of a mountain. One more question. How many feet high did you say this dome was? That's not how tall it is. That's, like, the this, this, like the distance around it, I believe. Oh, okay. It's 140. 
three feet. The height is, I forget what the height is because I didn't write it down, but it is also like massively high. So it's huge. And it was the tallest building there for a long period of time. So you would walk through the streets of Rome and just see this massive temple, which makes sense if it's meant to be this great temple that's for all of these different gods, that it's literally like the biggest thing in sight because it's huge mm-hmm. and solid. <laughs> And it, it didn't get picked apart like so many of the other structures from ancient Rome did, which is one of the things I like the most about it. Because everything else, you know, it either got destroyed what it was originally intended for, or it's been picked apart, kind of like, like the Colosseum and stuff. But the Pantheon, a lot of it's still there, so it looks pretty true to form of how it would have been. So was the Colosseum, like, taller and bigger around than the Pantheon? Because you said this was the biggest structure around for a long time. Um, the Colosseum, I believe, I don't remember what the heights are on all of these. I'd have to look up and compare them and see which was the biggest building. But at least in the game, the Colosseum is much wider around. It encompasses, like... Yeah, because it's an arena, versus uh, the Pantheon is just, like, high vertically. It is still pretty wide, though, because it's, like, a big facility that you can walk into, but it's very tall. Versus the Colosseum, it does hold a lot of people, but it's mostly, like, very wide. And that's mm-hmm. where all the seats would have been. Because you yeah. didn't want to sit up, like, super, super high. But I do know that, like, in-game when climbing this, this Colosseum is, like, maybe six building stories high. Which, today, that's, like, nothing. But for those medieval Renaissance structures, it's pretty high. The Colosseum's six stories high? It seems like about in, in, game, in game scale. But I'm just thinking, like, in terms of relating to. And I was Let's asking look you... look up and find out. Well, yeah. there's there's three of those little, like, ports mm-hmm. of the archways on you No, know, we can actually do that later because we will be going to the Colosseum again in a different episode. But, yeah, just for curiosity's sake, we'll look that. Um, I so the Colosseum continue. is 159 feet high and the Pantheon is 142, so it is slightly smaller than it. Oh, okay. But it's still a massive building. Oh, got it. The Parthenon is 45 feet high. St. Peter's Basilica is 448. These are very important to know right now. (laughs) I know. So, right, uh, we're just outside the Pantheon, um, and Egidio is being escorted there. Ezio is waiting in the shadows off somewhere. More guards await them at the entrance, and the escort says to Egidio, Egidio brought them, or the escort says to the main guard, that they join, uh, that Egidio brought the money. The guard leader says, Well, well, the banker has a special evening planned. I will be delivering your payment. Give it here. Egidio hesitates, but another guard draws his sword, and Egidio relinquishes the chest. And now this guard leader says, Hold him until I get back. The other guards do as instructed and restrain Egidio. The guard walks into the back of the Pantheon. Ezio says, I better not lose sight of the money. Egidio says, "Uh, why not release me? I have paid. And the guard says, he is counting the money. Until it is collected, you cannot leave. So now, Ezio must infiltrate the Pantheon. By the roof. (laughs) Which is why I asked how high this is. Okay. Okay. So your job is to scale up the back of the Pantheon on the dome side of the building. Um, Once he scales the wall of the building, he climbs up to the dome and then peers through the oculus to see the lead guard with the chest of money. And once he gets to that oculus, he has to scale down the dome from the climbing points inside. Now, I was uh, listening to the audiobook uh, not while taking these notes, but in between taking notes, like on a given day, let's say I have to finish taking notes and go to work, I would listen to the audiobook. And the audiobook says that instead of climbing down the inside of the dome, which the book claims would be impossible, even with the, even with the, uh, like nails or whatever fixtures there were that were kind of made little, uh, alcoves or footlets, uh, for you to scale down like a gecko. Uh, like, basically, like, a rock wall climber. You'd have, like, little, uh, grips to grab onto. 
They're saying none of those would support his weight, and Ezio kept this in mind. You're looking up the picture of the inside now? I'm looking at the... Wait, are you talking about he wouldn't be able to climb on the top of it, or he wouldn't be able to climb the on the inside? inside. This oh, inside. This yeah. inside. No, you, you can't put your feet in that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and then the game, they have, like, little nails stuck into that dome. For those unfamiliar with the inside of this dome, because, first of all, it's huge and it's wide, mm-hmm. but there's these little uh, square-shaped cutouts that are almost like little windows, and they're like little divots that are inside the concrete. Mm-hmm. But they're not deep enough to where like you could actually like place your feet and like no. scale down it. They're pretty smooth and it yeah. kind of makes it sound like they're treating him like you know, like those like like cat burglar type things where like yeah. you know, like they're like gonna rappel really fast down to like the ground floor and snatch the jewel and then go right back up the top. Well, it's funny that, that you mentioned sense. that, but I mean, um, no, in the game you scale down, you have to scale down the uh, through the dome, like you have to climb there but like i was saying he's not putting his foot in those there will be like nails like there's a path of nails that you follow that kind of guides you which is the best path down and everything mm-hmm. that he'll kind of like grip I think onto the slope I think. is still pretty yeah it would but be it's extreme. very it's very extreme yeah it's 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 impossible to like really especially with all the armor and clothing that he's wearing and really like drag him down so in the book they have it to where there's like incense burner chains dangle them mm-hmm. from the ceiling and he has to like basically go diving through the oculus and just make enough range to like go and snag one of the chains and he's like luckily the dome is cavernous enough and there's enough noise outside to distract the guard from hearing him try to catch on to that chain. all these yeah. chains yeah exactly it's like jacob marley's coming <laughs> yeah so yeah, for an instant, the guard's like, what is that? But he's too greedy to, like, care. So he looks back at the money chest, and then uh, Etsy is able to get him that way. But for the well, game... And you also, to... he's, like, totally exposed up there, because mm-hmm. there's nothing to hide behind. Other like, than... Yeah. That, look, see that? Yes. Like, you can see the entire circumference of the was, dome from the ground floor. Which is what I was going to say. Oh. is like, not only there are incense chains hanging, but there are some, like, cloth fabric curtains hanging from them too and Uh, like so when he grabs the chain he jumps onto one of those cloth things and pretty much wraps himself in it if you've seen like i know i saw it in uh one of the rush hour movies jackie chan uh to basically infiltrate like a building from the roof jumps on one of these silk cloths and then wraps it around himself so they can't see him oh yeah yeah. Yeah. (laughs) that's pretty much what the book is saying that he did he's jackie chan he's jackie chan um Now, the um, while he's doing this, the lead guard uh, mutters to himself uh, now to go kill that senator. So the plan was to collect the money and just kill the guy. He, there was no way he was getting out of it. So Ezio aerially assassinates him and then safely and noiselessly inside of the main room. So inside of this big dome, he jumps on the guy with all of his body weight and just crushes him. I feel like just that would kill him. You don't even yeah. need to stab him. Like, just fall off uh, on someone. Traditions being what they are, stab them through there. Poor man. Yeah. <laughs> My rib cage is already crushed, you ass. <laughs> yeah, these, these and the and the books, uh, when I was starting to listen to them, they go into brutal detail on how, like, just he crushes someone's, a soldier's stature by, like, leaping on them from, like, a really tall height. And somehow that breaks his fall, keeps him from, like, shattering his shins and everything. I don't know. But it's brutal. Um, so this was the senator we just took out, right? No. Oh, the banker. Okay. The senator is... No, this wasn't the banker. This is the lead guard at the oh, parking lot. that's supposed to... They had an escort lead them up to this point. This guy is another middleman, but he was never supposed to make it to the banker because nobody's supposed to know the banker's identity. Ah, uh, Okay. So we're pulling a Batman right now where we're killing the henchman but not the actual bad guy? Yes, but it goes. <laughs> we're taking it one step further than this. So once he assassinates this guy, he comes out dressed in this man's clothing and helmet that was conveniently built, has a built-in face mask so no one can see Ezio's face. Hmm. So he's switched, he's done a disguise swap so he can make it all the way to checkpoint C. Okay. Or checkpoint B, I guess it would be. Um, Master of disguise. One does what one must. 
Another guard asks if everything is going well in there and tells him that they are running late. Ezio secures the helmet and picks up the chest and walks outside to show them. And now the guard says, uh, the count is complete. And Ezio nods and he says, va bene, okay, kill him. He's talking about Egidio. And Ezio says, no. And the guard says to Egidio, huh, lucky you. Luigi says he gets to live. To Ezio, he says, lead the way, boss. So he's assuming the guise of this lead guard whose name is Luigi. Mm. This other guard is the guy who escorted them up to this point. Okay, you the boss. Yeah. Luigi was going to give the instruction as he was instructed to have Egidio killed anyway mm. once they got the money. So if Egidio just kind of skipped his death... Well, okay, when Ezio rescued him in the last episode, those guards were going to beat him to death for being behind on his payments anyways. Mm-hmm. I guess just for fun. Like, they didn't... They thought he would never pay up, so... Because they're the most genius loan sharks ever. Mm-hmm. Um, now we get a new mission. It is called Win in Rome... Dot, dot, dot. Disguised uh, disguised as the chest carrier, lead the guards to the banker's location without being detected and listen to their reactions to determine the correct route. For full sync, arrive at your destination in less than three minutes. So this is fun. These kind of missions, I mean, they're, they're not too risky, but they're also kind of annoying. So the guards have a suspicion... Uh, level meter and while leading them they will indicate if they notice you're turning the wrong direction Um, if you continue in the wrong direction their meter fills and they will become aware of your identity so in other words as you're walking down the street they will uh, they will tell you okay we're making good time and then you make a wrong turn they're like are you sure it's in this direction? I'm not questioning your authority. I just think that it would make better time going the other way. And then that tells you you have to turn around and head the other way. And you do this because you don't know the location. Luigi knew the location, but you killed him. So these guys know the location, but they're not going to give it to you outright because they don't want to make assumptions. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you kind of have to get led around. Um and that's what, for full sync, you know, you do this in less than five minutes. But if you, if they take too long to react to your bad turns or whatever, you'll just lose full sync. So the group co- crosses the Ponte Sisto, and on the opposite side, there are two more guards who await them. The Ponte Sisto is a bridge um, leading up to the location. One of these guards is in full body armor with the frog mouth helmet um, on his head. So he's a very intimidating figure. The guard in the lighter armor says, Hand me the chest, Luigi. I will bring it to the banker. The frog mouth helmet guard tells Ezio that he may enter uh, the banker's premises, but then he blocks the other three guards from entering. Um, they know it's a party, so they want to go in. They're saying, we can't go in. And one of the guards, yeah, one of the guardsmen asks him, we can't go in. The helmet soldier replies, you have patrol order. Uh, you have to patrol by order of Cesare. And the guard just kind of despondently says, por caputana, which apparently means fuck me. Realize, uh, re- uh, yeah, he replies to the other guardsman, Ezio, uh, whispers to himself out loud, Cesare, he's here. So he thinks he might get lucky tonight, as in might be able to kill two birds in one stone kind of thing. Another guardsman runs up out of the blue as Etsy is walking through to the party um, to speak with the helmet guard. He says, Luigi has been killed. We discovered his body at the Pantheon. And the helmet guard says, Luigi, we just let him in. And then they all rush. I think I wrote this wrong. They all rush into the party to search for uh, the false Luigi. So now the guards that were going to be on patrol are now allowed into the party, but only to find out where the false Luigi went. <laughs> so this mission is called In and Out. As your identity has been compromised, you have very little time. 
Yeah, I would, yeah, get out. Yeah. Just make this a quick in and out. Mm-hmm. In, stab, out. Bye. Follow the money to get to the banker. Kill him and then escape. For full sync, kill the banker from a bench without being detected. So back to Ezio. He has uh, changed out of Luigi's garb, which is compromised, so good idea. But now he's just back in his assassin's garb, which I guess... Might as well. (laughs) (laughs) I I can't remember. He has convened with three courtesans in a place hidden from the other partygoers, and he instructs them to tell Claudia that the banker is here at this location. So three of the courtesans go off while the other ones stay at the party. They have another mission for them. Ezio must now uh, tail the chest through the party without being spotted. One of the... Conveniences? Oh, yeah. One of the conveniences is that there are clusters of courtesans planted all along the road. Once the money chest changes hands to a new guard, a young courtesan takes a keen interest in the new guard. She intends to distract him to allow Ezio to follow undetected. Uh, the steps walk the steps they walk lead them up to the Trastavere, which is an old ruin where the main festivities are being held. Um so, in other words, she's, like, kind of hanging on this guard, like, arm candy. It's like, ooh, your arms are so strong and everything. And he's like, oh, yes, you know, you want to feel my muscles and stuff. It's this kind of dialogue that goes on for a while. I didn't write it down because it's, like, nonsense. But um, once the guard and the courtesan arrive, they halt in front of a man dressed in cardinal's hat. And nothing else ooh, but a jeweled necklace and a... Ram skull cod piece over a red loincloth. So that's what he's wearing. Cardinal's hat, gold chain necklace, loincloth with ram skull cod piece. And nothing else. And nothing else. That's maybe, disturbing. Maybe some shoes. But, um. Maybe. Shoes are optional. <laughs> <laughs> shoes, your destiny. <laughs> <laughs> And I also put down, not to be mean, but this is an observation that you'll make in the game. He is easiest the fattest man. He's easily the fattest man there, which means he's probably the wealthiest. This can be none other than the banker. And the guard, carrying the chest, says to him, money for you, banker. And the banker looks them both over and he says, I will take that and that. He says this as he snatches the young courtesan off the guard's arm. And then he tells the guard, you are dismissed. And the guard sulkily walks away. And soon as he's walking away, he makes a remark that uh, as he searches himself, uh, he remarks, where did I put my coin purse? Which means the courtesan that was all over him also pickpocketed him. Where so. would he have had space to, st- to save it? Hmm? But never mind. <laughs> where would he have? No, not... The, the other guy, yes. The guard was pickpocketed. Yes. The guard had armor on, yeah. <laughs> no, if it was him, it would have been in his ram skull cod piece. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Should have very deft fingers. It also comes with a zipper for storage. <laughs> <laughs> There's it's nothing so else. convenient. You can wear There's it to your next event. There's nothing else down there. <laughs> your next smoothest colony event. Right. <laughs> Your next uh, Burning Man. <laughs> We've seen weirder stuff in Florida. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> mm, well, I've seen weirder stuff in Florida. <laughs> the courtesan smiles at the banker, saying, Honoratissima, it is an honor. And the banker says, Welcome to my party. I am Juan Borgia. And a Borgia guardsman runs up interrupting them. Cesare is about to speak in the main uh, room, Excellency. And uh, Borgia just says, ah, come to the courtesan. And he leads her towards the main room. As he does so, one of the Borgia guards is left near the chest guarding it until a clever courtesan steals the guard away 
to uh, Smoochy Smoochy while the others sneak in and steal the chest. So I have a database entry for Juan Borgia. Let's quickly cover the Trastevere, the notes on that, and was there something else? You want Agostino Chigi? Okay. Yeah, I was trying to think if he comes up somewhere else, but no. He, Agostino Chigi, I think we mentioned that in the last episode. Um, yeah, because it was mentioned by Claudia. Like, they were saying, uh, who does Cesare's banking? And uh, Agostino Chigi does. And no, he's, no. Huh? No, he Other does one? not do... That's that's the whole purpose of this mission. Now, uh, Rodrigo Borgia had Agostino Chigi as the Vatican's banker or yes. as his personal banker, mm -hmm. but Cesare didn't trust his father or his banker, so he went to another banker who was this one Borgia guy. There's too many bankers. Wait, okay. I'm so confused. Because <laughs> one Borgia means that he's part of the Borgia family. We're going to get to that. Yeah. So, okay. Agostino well, Chigi. Agostino Chigi, he is an Italian banker who created one of the wealthiest business empires in Italy. The family are now, and, and then and now, are a large source of revenue for the church and for many of the popes. And they even influenced a lot of the popes that came into the pope ship throughout time. And the Trastevere is an area in Rome that houses the Villa Farnisa, which is the massive estate of Agostino Chigi. So you're in the area that where his house is, or his. So we're at that he Augustine, had Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Already at the other banker's house. Woo Ooh. He's out of town. <laughs> well, it's funny, and then Apparently. this is why I'm having a hard time keeping track of bankers because there's so many bankers and banking families in Italy at this point in time. I mean, so yeah, it's like, that's how the Medici Empire was built, and that's literally what yeah. Ezio's family was. So it's like a bunch of banking families. It's hard to keep y'all straight. <laughs> anybody who I guess banking became very popular at this time, and everybody, mm -hmm. anybody who was anybody well, was a banker. Italy is like a huge if they trade royalty. area as well. Yeah. So you got like a lot of revenue moving around, and bank Basically, yeah, you have massive banks and they're funding all of these different things that are going on. You even have other countries mm -hmm. that are using Italian banks. So, I yeah. Was, I just pictured, Banking like, downtown Miami where you got all these, like, Bank of America and Chase Bank Towers. It's like, my tower's bigger than yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to build mine just 20 feet taller. Ha ha! And I'm going to put steeples on the top of it mm -hmm. so I can be bigger than yours. But at Christmas time, mine's going to have red and green flashing lights. Beat that. Yeah. <laughs> um... Now, where did I leave off? Okay, so we're at the database entry for, for that. Juan Borgia. Yeah. Okay, this is going to explain it. Database entry for Juan Borgia the Elder. Uh, his date of birth is 1446. His professional is Cardinal and Cesare's personal financier. The first of ten nephews elected to the cardinalship by Rodrigo Borgia, Juan sought a privileged position by the Borgia court. In the Borgia court. He helped Cesare negotiate an allegiance with the Baron de Valois in 1499, impressing the young captain general with his knowledge of French taste. In an incident recorded by Bouchard, the papal master of ceremonies, Juan and Cesare were seated discussing financial matters when a steward brought in a glass of wine. Juan took a sip, declared the wine to be false, accusing the astonished steward of drinking the real bottle, he then threw the wine over the steward and lit him on fire. Fortunately, the wine was not capable of igniting, but unfortunately, the steward was still executed once the small fire was put out. Such incidents would ha must have impressed Cesare as he shunned Rodrigo Borgia's banker, Agostino Chigi, to invest with Juan. Juan was gradually put in charge of Rome's finances, he used large amounts of the city's tax money to throw lavish parties for his friends, at one point tossing a hundred gold plates into the Tiber after their use, outdoing Chigi, who had done the same with mere silver. Rome citizens were also invited to the public areas of these parties, but many still complained privately that their money could be put to better use. So, according to this, there is one Borgia who is the younger brother of Cesare, and that's often the one Borgia people speak of, that one Borgia at this point has already been killed by Cesare. Um, I can't remember the exact reason why, but family feuding. And then um, this 
Juan Borgia is his cousin, is his older cousin. And basically, I guess you would think that he wouldn't go against Rodrigo Borgia, but I guess there's so many um, Borgias at this point. They're like Lannisters and, you know, they're just... Like in the and does this family yeah. stop breeding? <laughs> I guess that that's what this means. So, um, well, we can discuss some family drama. Um, so he so, he's trying they, to get closer to the central family, like the yeah yeah. But I find it interesting that they mentioned that story about Gustino Cheeky of him throwing the plates into the river because uh-huh. that is like a real thing that was said about him is that he just had so much money that he would do that to show up at parties. But it's also theorized that he probably had the. Either that didn't happen, or he'd quickly send servants down to go pick them up. Of like, don't just throw silver into the river. Are you crazy? Um, throw them into the river. Yay. And I go get it. What? <laughs> <laughs> this was fun. Oh, this is not fun. This is no longer fun. I hate this. This is terrible. Well, it definitely seems like somebody who kind of like, you know, spends money or gives money uh, to some people, but then expects it back, but just once the idea of his generosity mm-hmm. put out there, but not actually I'm being so generous. wealthy. Yeah. Tushibalba? Tushibalba! <laughs> like, uh... That's, that's actually, yeah, that actually relates it's, exactly. If anyone's yeah. seen the El Dorado movie, that's uh, the, the part where they think that, because they're telling these people that they're basically gods, you know, and then they're so like, they oh, the here's all these yeah. golds that are gifts for the gods. Shall we send it on to the heavens? And like, yeah, sure, which... They them thinking like oh let's send it to Shivalba. They don't realize that it means like we're gonna toss it into this yeah, river. Yeah, they think it's think like a toast. That's the path yeah. to yeah. heaven. Like <laughs> yeah, they no they sent it down a whirlpool, which like the doorway to Shivalba. Mm-hmm. I think Shivalba was like an underworld, but I don't know exactly. But yeah, basically to them to get to the afterlife, they have to go through this whirlpool. Yes. So they throw all of their gold into this whirlpool and of course the guys who are trying to get this gold are devastated because that's then, not yeah, what they wanted they stop the procession halfway through and like maybe we could enjoy this now and he's like stop the gods wish to enjoy their wealth here mm-hmm. <laughs> after like half of the proceedings have been thrown into the yeah you're like, not going to get those back <laughs> but they do find them later on <laughs> okay so some family drama First of all, let's talk about the breakdown of Rodrigo Borgia's sons. I'm only going to go through the oldest three because it starts getting really confusing when you have too many names going on here. But, so Rodrigo Borgia has three older, old, eldest sons, and he has more, but we're just going to focus on these three. Oh, I forgot to, like, yeah, because for some reason I was watching the series and I thought there was only uh, Juan Cesare and Lucrezia, but then they did mention that there there's another a younger, younger boy. Brother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's Pedro Luis, who was his eldest son, um, who was born in 1458 to 1460. Then he had Juan Borgia, who was born in 1474, which is like a 14-year difference between him. And then Cesare Borgia, who was born in 1475. So Juan and Cesare are, you know, one year apart from each other, but Pedro is significantly older than either of them. I have never heard of Pedro. I definitely heard of Giovanni Borgia. But... Yeah. Uh, well, Giovanni is Juan's name. So he's actually, well, I mean, he's Giovanni Borgia, but he's Juan Giovanni he's Borgia. He's one of the Juans. We're about to get to the, the Juan Juan. No, this is the Juan Juan. There is only one Juan. <laughs> yeah, but she said that the Juan that was killed by Cesare was the younger brother. No, it's the older brother. Okay. So in the Assassin's Creed one, they're having it. Well, actually, they refer to him as a cousin in your description, which makes a lot more sense. Yeah, Juan the Elder is the is his cousin Mm -hmm. and then they were saying in the game one the younger was killed by cesare one being his younger brother um which i didn't find any juan borgia the elder or the younger he might be an actual person um but i only know of one juan borgia and that would be okay his elder brother he wasn't younger than him (laughs) okay maybe he was older now that makes sense because okay in the tv series they had him be older than Juan, uh, which didn't make sense because the whole reason for him, basically, uh, he, the old Juan being the older got to be the general and got to do whatever he yeah, wanted. Let and me then, go. Let me let me say let me say my thing. Okay. <laughs> so it's Pedro Luis is born first. Second mm-hmm. is Juan Borgia, also known as Giovanni Borgia, mm-hmm. and then you have Cesare Borgia. But Juan and Cesare are literally a year apart from each other. Juan's only one year older. So. 
Um, so of course, of course, in history, we're used to the idea that the eldest son gets everything, all the titles, all the money, everything goes to the eldest son. And then the younger sons are left to basically either to figure out stuff for their own, find some other trade, help out the older brother, or they're usually sent to the church to become church officials. But something happened that interrupted this system in the Borgia family. Um, in 1491, Pedro Luis actually died. And he had claimed the family title of being the Duke of Gandia. Um, and he even had a wife as well. Um, so when he died, Juan then became the eldest son. So he married his older brother's wife and took on that title of the Duke of Gandia. Um, and his wife was Mar Maria Enriquez de Luna. And she was also from a very powerful and wealthy family. So since he was now the eldest son, he was made the commander of the papal army in 1496 for the first of um, Pope Alexander's campaigns in Italy. And around this time, he was 23 and Cesare would have been about 22 years old. Cesare, um, as now being the only second son, um, ends up becoming a leader in the church and serving as archbishop and then cardinal. And he even was able to serve as one of Rodrigo Barda's main advisors. Um, but there is lots of rumor that there was a lot of friction there, which I mean, kind of makes sense because it went from being, they have this much elder, older brother who's 14 years older than them. He gets to have the title. He gets to be the soldier and all those things. And then Cesare and Juan are pretty much equals. But then when Pedro dies, Juan becomes like the big leader who gets to have all the cool stuff and gets to play soldier and have a wife versus Cesare sent to go work in the church, sit around and like, you know... Yeah, he becomes a cardinal. Well, if, well, I mean, like, the cardinals at this point in time, you know, they're kind of like being, almost like being a politician. Like, that's kind of what your life is, you know, versus yeah. he wants to go be soldier. He's 20 years old, you know, he wants to go out and do things and not be stuck in the church all the time doing church events. Um, so Juan was mysteriously murdered in 1497. After not returning home after a feast hosted at his mother's home, Juan Borgia was found with his throat cut and multiple stab wounds throughout his torso. Um, even though an investigation was launched, a, the killer was never found. And it's believed that at first the investigation was super intense and then it just kind of like cut off. Like they're like, okay, that was intense enough. Let's just stop it here. And that's yeah. it. So that's the Juan Borgia that usually is referred to whenever you refer to Juan Borgia and the family. Though they did have many cousins that did live in Italy um, and were also pushed through, like, the cardinalship and took on these really um, high titles that they should not have had at their ages because of good old-fashioned nepotism. And since, you know, mm -hmm. uncle is pope, we can basically do whatever we want at this point in time. But I could not find any other Juan Borgia, but there were others. But that's the Juan Borgia who was killed by Cesare. <laughs> okay. There wasn't much info on this one, Borgia, but he could have been one of any cousins. Yeah, it could have just been, like, an insert cousin name here. And, like, since Juan Borgia is a historical name. But, like you said, yeah. Juan Borgia was supposed to have been killed in 1497. Um, but he is an elder brother, from what I understand. Everything I see shows him as being the second son, which is why he got to be soldier. I think and that's Cesare how they did him in the, the game. Church. There were so few mentions of him in the game, I think I just defaulted back to the show where he's the younger brother. Uh, um. But yeah, I I can I'll have to later pull up Cesare's biography, which I think details stuff about, and also Lucrezia's biography, which I didn't go into. Her biography, meaning her database page that Sean mm. Hastings put together, because mm -hmm. um, he has info, he has background info on all of these according to the history that was uncovered through his research, and not the history we would find online, because that would be all propaganda by the Templars. <laughs> so the real real history of okay? K. Right. As Ezio sneaks his way through the Bacchanal over to one, I don't know if I mentioned this party, it pretty much looks like an old fashioned Bacchanal with people wearing laurel wreaths and uh, you know, antlered masks and everything. It looks like it looks more pagan than anything and there's a cardinal there so it's very much like i think they're just really hyping up this whole like mm -hmm. the borgia do not care anything about the church or being church people it's all about that that's true that that's exactly where the game's going with it mm -hmm. um so as Ezio sneaks his way through the bacchanal over to Juan, we hear Juan speaking to the courtesan 
Uh, Juan says, are you having a pleasant evening? The courtesan says, yes, said Chilenza. Uh, I am. There is so much to look at. And Juan says, oh, good. I spared no expense. The courtesan says, I can tell. And Juan says, the finer things in life make power so rewarding. I see an apple. I pluck that apple. No one will stop me. And the courtesan says, well, it depends on whose tree it is. And the one says, you don't seem to understand, my dear. I own all the trees. And the courtesan says, not mine. And one replies, on the contrary, I watched you steal my God's money. I believe I've earned a free ride as repentance. In fact, I want you here all night long. So, ew. Gross. Yeah. They basically, they and they've really built him into this, I hate to say it, uh, Weinstein-like character. So, to, to make him more of a target. You know, Cesare's a big bad, but we need to make them kind of on... Well, we're back to that, 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 that trope level. that we've been doing for like the longest uh-huh. time of that. Okay, this person's not just like bad, but they're like bad, bad. So don't feel bad about having yeah, to assassinate them. Yeah, with the them. first game. It's like first you have to see them like mercilessly uh, beat and murder somebody in the square, so you can get geared up to go in and kill them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. like not only so it's justified. Not only do they kill someone, but they also like stole money from poor sick children. <laughs> like, yeah, just layer it on. Yeah, they did like. What was the the one Templar guy that was pretty much just a hospital? No, he was like a Mangala. He did like you know yeah, like the experimentation on, on people. Yeah, so they. Well, that they one do that also kind time. of followed up more with like the idea of like mm-hmm. were they actually that bad though? So I wonder if this one's going to do the same, or if this one's like no, no, they're monsters. It's fine. Yeah, well, they do one thing and they say another. You know, it's kind of like they're they're very much like. Uh, or is it more of, like, them arguing for, like, oh, well, the ends justified the means? That That's pretty much all they That's all of them. That's all they're doing is basically saying that. And that, that's the arguments they give, like, every time. Mm. So, they, you know, they've just gone beyond that point where they care about anything else than the bigger picture. So Ezio follows them, them being Juan and the courtesan, Back to a ruined courtyard. They're at the face of the ruined building, surrounded by guards. Uh, They're at the face of the ruined building, surrounded by guards, is Cesare and Juan Borgia. They're both about to address the crowd. (laughs) So Ezio's still kind of off at the back of the party, trying to stay out of sight and witnessing the address. Cesare says, as he's addressing his guests, What better way to celebrate my victories than to join in brotherhood of man? Soon we will be here once more celebrating a united Italia, and then the feasting will last for forty days and forty nights. Cominciamo ora! Which means begin now. Everyone else goes back to the festivities, and Rodrigo pulls Cesare off to the side. Um, Rodrigo says, we did not agree to conquer Italia. And Cesare says, if your brilliant Captain General, if your brilliant Captain General says we can do it, why not rejoice and let it happen? Rodrigo says, you risk upsetting the delicate balance of control we have worked so hard to tighten. Cesare says, I appreciate all that you have done for me, but I have the army, so I am making the decisions. And then he says, don't look so glum. Enjoy yourself. And then he walks off. Both Rodrigo and Cesare depart before Ezio has time to get anywhere near them. So that, once again, slipped out of the grasp. (laughs) Just as he was present, he just kind of made his way away. Always Ezio is just out of reach before grabbing Cesare. Now, while Cesare and Rodrigo and their guards are still in uniform, almost everyone else is wearing either a noble attire or revealing garments with either deer or goat skull masks adorned with laurels. 
that's what I meant by all of the pagan imagery that's flagrantly around everything. Um, find a bench around the courtyard at which to sit, and you will blend in with the other wallflowers. Uh, Juan is patrolling his VIP guests to make certain they are enjoying themselves. As he does so, Ezio can assassinate him undetected by stabbing him while remaining seated. So he will walk up to Ezio and he'll walk around to all his guests. As he crosses near the bench where Ezio is, Ezio can, while still being seated, as he's seated, he's blending in with everybody else because that's just part of the game mechanics. Mm. So you blend in with the other people that are sitting on the bench. So Ezio's quick enough to where um, if the target crosses by the bench, he can stab them. And as that target, or in this case, one, starts to stumble, he will do a quick flip stance, which means not like fighting game. I guess flip stance isn't the right word. He'll do a quick kind of like switcheroo thing where he gets out of his seat and flips the stumbling guy to fall into the seat to look like he just kind of stumbled drunkly into the seat as he is having too much wine. Hmm. And then people buy that for a second until the blood starts falling out. So, but it buys you some time, you know, if you do that assassination discreetly, it can buy you maybe like up to like 10 seconds or something where you can like run out of the vicinity before the guards, before someone alarms the guards. Hey, this guy's dead. So now we get the deathbed confessional. And Juan says, the things I have felt, seen and tasted. I do not regret a moment of it. Ezio says, A man of power must be contemptuous of delicacies. Juan says, But I gave the people what they wanted. Ezio says, And now you pay for it. Il bacere immeritato si consuma da se. The pleasure unearned consumes itself. Requiescat in pace. After fleeing the scene of the festival assassination, Ezio heads over to the Rosa and Fiore to check on the money that Claudia's courtesan stole from the banker. I have a new mission it's called Paper Trail. Claudia's girls have stolen the banker's money, but there's trouble at the Rosa and Fiore. So when Ezio arrives on this scene, he sees two distraught courtesans at the house entrance. And Ezio is alarmed. He says, where are Claudia and Maria? The courtesan said, We came back with the money. They followed us home. They meaning the guards. So Ezio, for fear of his sister, uh, rushes inside the establishment to see for himself. Inside there are bodies of a host of Borgia guards all over the floor. And then Claudia is standing in the middle of them with a blood-stained dress holding a knife. She looks toward Ezio, who is astonished, and Claudia says, What? And Ezio says, My sister knows how to wield a knife. Claudia, twirling the knife in one hand, says, And I am ready to do it again. Ezio says, Spoken like a true auditore. And then their mother, Maria, walks in and says, Finally, you two came to your senses. It's about time. And then they share a family hug. So now the tension that was between Claudia and Ezio is resolved. His, it's mainly, you know, to show that his concern this whole time is that she's nothing but a liability who senselessly puts herself into danger, which causes him to, which compromises his missions and everything, and she's just proven that she can handle herself. But so, ah, now I can see that you can kill people, and cool. <laughs> yeah. So this is the end of sequence five with the banker. I do want to make one quick correction. Yeah. Uh, to when I mentioned the the Pantheon. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Pantheon, its name is not the high place. The, it comes from Athena Parthenos. Or not Pantheon, Parthenon. sorry. Parthenon. Yeah. Athena Parthenos. Sorry, I thought that that sounded mm -hmm. weird. Athena Parthenos, which is her title of Athena Virgin. So it's oh, okay. like a, a monument to her and uh -huh. her virginity as a goddess. The Acropolis right. is where it's located. That's where the high place name comes from. 
in all of that part of its big oh, structure. Okay. I know that was super important, but I just I wanted to correct it. I didn't know that was it. one of her titles, <laughs> but I was listening to a recent story about <laughs> Athena where they said that her common name, or one of the common names she goes by is Pallas Athena, because she took on Pallas being the one of the daughters of Poseidon, who was her friend who she accidentally killed in a tournament for feeling guilty for that. She took on her name. Huh. Because there was nothing <laughs> left of her when she killed her, she turned into back into the ocean. She Damn, I water. did not hear this story. No? That sounds fascinating. Oh, what did yeah. she do to her that there was nothing left? Well, she killed her, but the daughter of Poseidon was a water nymph, so she turned into water and just kind of fell into the ocean. Mm. And Zeus was basically telling her, don't feel so bad about it. And she's like, that was my friend. Zeus is like, I kill women like every other week. It's fine. He's just happy that she could kill somebody, like, you know. And then she she feels guilty, so she tries to adopt more, uh, a more uh, effeminate side, and just stops fighting because she doesn't want to kill anymore, and she wants to like pick up weaving and things. And then she gets mad at Arachne and curses her. So uh, it goes really well. I think he's still mad about the whole being carved out of the head thing. Mm-hmm. But um, but we digress. <laughs> <laughs> so. And the trophy that we earned for completing this mission was called Fundraiser, because hey, we stole a bunch of money from a bunch of drunk Just louts the most and fucked up bitches. fundraiser yeah. ever. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a fundraiser, you know. <laughs> we murdered a half naked cardinal. Yeah. Well, not only that, but it was a fundraiser because all of the girls had to participate. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So it's pretty easy fundraiser. Not great. Oh, well, the boards are worse, right? Not yeah. good times. Much worse. <laughs> oh, God, and I, I didn't feel like mentioning this, but I will mention that if you read the book, which I might mention later, uh, there are graphic scenes of, like, the, uh, of the, what, how do you say it? Of the fornication? Mm. Yeah. This is, like, Game of Thrones graphic? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, the There's, books get pretty detailed. The so. books, the books detail stuff like a lot of choking out happening and like just kind of like creepy, snuffy stuff. See, whenever like, it's stuff like that, I'm always like, wow, this author has a fetish that they really want to share with the world, and it's like, I do you really know. need to? Isn't I feel like they were just trying to do what the game did, but just push it a level further. And I'm like, just, how that, can we make this even necessary? more like visceral? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, sequence six, we're on the Baron de Valois. Um, Ezio returns to the Casama di Alviano to check on uh, Bartolomeo's progress. As soon as he arrives there, Bart turns on him with his sword raised, demanding, Who goes there? And Ezio says, Salve to you too. And Bart says, Ezio! He lowers his weapon. I was expecting my wife. And he sheathes the sword. And Ezio says, somehow, that does not surprise me. And then Bart says, the French putane have us under pressure. Putane means whores. And by French whores, he's referring to the French soldiers. Uh, this is just how... <laughs> Sorry. This is just how I'm this sure man talks. I'm sure that's exactly how it went. Like, <laughs> Yeah, this is just how this man talks. You, 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 you just French, kind of, yeah. You just learn to... Bypass his vulgarity. Ezio says, tell me about the, the general, this Baron de Valois. And Bart says, Cesare persuaded King Louis to lend him an entire army to defeat me. I am flattered. Ezio says, where can I find him? Bart says, it is only a matter of time before I have Valois by the throat. We have them in retreat. Just as he's saying this, a musket ball is shot uh, at them and deflects off of the fortress wall behind their heads. And Ezio looks at him and says, they seem to be getting closer. And Bart says dismissively, their situation is under control. And then a, one of the guards men comes up and says, close the gates! And then Bart says, okay, Bene, I guess I could use a little help. And then you get a new mission, it's called the Gatekeeper. So in this mission, Bart loses all his calm. Ezio, close the gates! <laughs> it's nothing. It's fine. Oh my god, close the door, close the door. <laughs> yeah, he, he pretty much makes a big mess. Ezio, clean it up! 
So uh, prevent the French troops from seizing the barracks by lowering the gates leading inside. And then full sink, do not take any damage. Uh-huh. Is that all? As swarms of French soldiers pour in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Ezio must fight them back while trying to drop the three gates on the outer wall. And Bart is of no help. Bartolomeo only has five life squares, so you need to get the gates lowered promptly. Once this is done, the Baron de Valois signals from the field outside. He is on horseback as he's leading his army on the battlefield, and then he halts them right outside of the barracks to parley with Bart. And I'm going to try to do this Valois accent. Tell me to do it. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> I don't think you can read my handwriting. Sorry. Oh, fair. Valois says, Bonjour, General de Aviano. Et à vous, Piet, à vous, rendre. Are you ready to surrender? Just what this means in English. Except the part that was Bonjour, General de Aviano. I'm sure you know what that means. Yeah, you know what that means. Hello, General Aviano. I, you don't need to, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Hello, General Aviano. Stop. You smell like pee. Stop. <laughs> I, not reading him. I can't remember what, what comedy skit was doing that, but they were basically the messenger, and they had to come in and read it like a telegram. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, and they're like, what was it? Oh, they was making fun of Zuko. It was this YouTube video. And he's like, ha, 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 stop. I've captured the avatar. Stop. You're, hor- you're horribly disfigured. Stop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, <laughs> that one cracks me. And then Valois says, uh, no, Bart replies to Valois. He says, why don't you come closer and say that? And Valois says, you must learn to speak French. It would mask your barbaric sensibilities. And Bart says, perhaps you can teach me, and I would instruct you in fighting. I don't know. <laughs> it almost sounded like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> That's not what I'm trying to go for. <laughs> Little did you know, Bartolomeo is secretly Austrian and also a bodybuilder from <laughs> the 20th century. The governor. And he says, I could instruct you in fighting since you seem to do so little of it. Valois says, as amusing as this parley has been, I lack your unconditional surrender before sunrise. And Bart says, ha, my lady Bianca will whisper it in your ear. And he unsheathes Bianca. Valois says, I believe another lady might object to that. And then he motions his soldiers to bring forth a restrained Pantastilia. We recall Pantastilia is the name of Bartolomeo's wife. He has her captive. Pantastilia says, Mio marito a mesera tutti. Mio marito a mesera tutti. My husband is going to murder all of you. And Bart says, I'll kill you, you for two tot French. <laughs> I'll kill you, you French fuck. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very serious moment, Jared. His, yeah, his, uh, God. Uh, the mouth on this guy. We can honestly make a whole dictionary of all the swear words we're learning in Italian and French today. <laughs> Bawa says, Calm down, for your wife's sake. You know my terms. Enter my camp unarmed at dawn. I can't help but do the Monty Python thing. Sucks. (laughs) Because I am French, why do you think I have this outrageous accent? (laughs) He rides away and then turning over, uh, turning over? Turning back, says, and practice your French. Soon all of Italy will be speaking it. You're English stupid pig yeah. dog. <laughs> <laughs> you Italian stupid pig dog. <laughs> so, God, French people are going to hate us. Hey, no, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, too. I'm not We watch way to too much Monty Python. French. Uh, and Bart says, uh, I will get you your pizza di merda figlio di putana. I'm sure you can guess what that means. Mm-hmm. I don't, I've heard these Italian words enough where I could, like, translate it without. Oh, he said, you piece of shit, son of a bitch. 
Figlio, I know, means son. Merda is shit in a lot of languages. Pezzo is a, a piece. Yeah. Why, thank you for teaching us. Breaking <laughs> it down. You're welcome. I offer classes to children between <laughs> the ages of... <laughs> between the ages of what, 5 and 13. <laughs> if you want to bring home a colorful new language... Bart saddles up and chases Valois down immediately. Ezio is left little choice but to follow suit. They ride down the road all the way to the French encampment, which is an occupied fortress. Ezio asks Bart, this is their camp? Like, he said camp, right? Not a fortress. But Bartolomeo unhorses and approaches the guards to hurl insults at the French general, trying to bait him into coming down in person. So he's trying to bait him into a fight. And plus, you know, just to let steam off, Bart has to make up a whole bunch of outlandish... You'll see. And Bart says, You steal a man's wife and then go hide inside a fortress? Nothing hangs between your thighs. In fact, there is a hole there so deep, it reaches the maledetto inferno. Which means the fucking underworld. And now musket balls are whizzing past Bart's head. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm, mean, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I'm forced not to flash back to Monty Python where it's like we have livestock being thrown <laughs> <laughs> I told them we already have one. <laughs> I, I love Monty <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, Ezio has to come uh, talk him down. So Ezio says, what good are, what good are you to her dead? We will regroup and fight through the gates as we did at the Arsenal. So if we'll recall, he's referring back to the time when they were in Venice and they had to fight their way in to get to, what was the guy's name? Silvio Barbarigo? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Silvio Barbarigo. Yeah. So Bartolomeo says this won't work. Bartolomeo says, the entrance is thicker with Frenchmen than the streets of Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite a visual. <laughs> Can I imagine the streets of Paris are pretty thick? So that's a bold claim. Mm -hmm. hmm. They just ran them all in this little tiny fortress, apparently. Mm -hmm. And Ezio says, So we will climb the battlements. And Bart says, They cannot be sealed. Or they cannot be scaled. Penticilia would know what to do. Maybe this is the end. I enter at dawn bearing gifts and hope that coward spares her life. And Ezio, with sudden inspiration, says, But che non, non si ho pensato prima. Why didn't I think of it before? Yeah, I think I said that right. Oh, perfect. Bart says, baffled, what did I say? Ezio replies, Call your men back uh, to the barracks. I will explain there. And Bart says, You better have something good. And then he shouts to his men, Fall back! So, and then I have a database entry for Octavian de Valois. I think it will go, so I'll read this database entry, and you give me info on him afterwards, so we'll compare I don't think notes. I have Valois. Okay, so yeah, that, that tracks, that makes sense, because as we just had to look up, <laughs> Valois is a fictional character. Yes. He's central, central to this plot, but he's related to some real people, so we have info we can cover on that. Yes. I'm going to cover his database entry real quick now. So, Octavian de Valois. Born in 1448, his profession is French general. The unexpected crowning of his distant cousin, Louis XII, in 1498, propelled Octavian the Baron de Valois to the front of the ranks in Louis' new Italian campaign. According to the accounts of the king's secretary, the Baron had only formal training, no actual field experience. He then quipped, the things one does for one's family. So nobody respects this guy. Valois encountered Cesare and Juan Borgia when they arrived at France to court Cesare's future wife, Charlotte. I guess I should have mentioned her for... Oh, well. <laughs> we'll get to her eventually. Oh, yeah. I'm back. sure she comes back. 
They spent a month together at court, at which point the Baron left for Italy. Several letters were exchanged between the two in ciphertext only. Uh, recently cracked... <laughs> he makes it sound like he went to court to marry Charlotte, but was secretly courting the Baron <laughs> or something. I mean... You have an army. Secretly courting yeah. France, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, good looking. I like that army. Mm. So much... Calvary men, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so the ciphertext was only recently cracked, uh, discussing something repeatedly referred to as our plans for Italy, their honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the king of France was mentioned as the accomplice in these plans, which makes it weird. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk about France's plans for Italy. I'm almost done. Okay. The Baron de Valois marched into Rome with his men in 1500. For what purpose, it remains unclear. At that point, however, Bartolomeo and his men attacked. Okay, so that's all they have on Octavian. Well, the purpose is very clear. What the French wanted and what the King Louis... Oh, my gosh. I just lost his... The 12th. The 12th, yeah. Because you you kept on saying the seventh, and now my brain's all messed up. <laughs> but King Louis the twelfth. Did I say was, the seventh? Yes. I keep messing those Roman numerals up. You're killing me, honestly. Um, but yeah, so what King Louis was after was the same thing that what his uh, predecessor Charles the eighth was after, which is this long disputed claim over the kingdom of Naples. Um, it's really complicated, and I don't want to get into the details of it because there's a lot of like, well, this person was named as a successor, but this person's related by blood, but then they changed their mind about the successor to somebody else, and a lot of back and forth when it came to this. But so basically, the kings of France, which was Charles and then followed by Louis, had this claim over the kingdom of Naples, which, you know, uh-huh. Naples wasn't super thrilled about. <laughs> so there was like this big back and forth of fighting over it to get that part of their kingdom back. Because I know like, you know, people are known as like the king of France or like the king of England, but they're, these are all like territories that are divvied up amongst these royal families. So you can have someone who's technically the king of France, but oh yeah, they also have this little kingdom over here and this little kingdom over there. And that's why when you look at their titles, you'll see not just the country that they're king or queen of, but you'll see a list of all these other locales that are added into it. And it gets really complicated after a while. And then a lot of these people don't even live anywhere near this place that they're ruling over. (laughs) So that makes it even more complicated and weird. And then there's arguments on like, well, he's not Italian. <laughs> as I mean, that's well. like everywhere, though. That's everywhere. That's in like all of these royal families. Like, even if you look at like the royal family of England today, you'll see that yeah. stuff going on. So, but yeah, that's basically what you have, and that is why France. Part of the reason why France is so gung ho to fight on the side of the Borgia and get back into Italy because the Borgia pretty much said like, "Oh yeah, you can have Naples. That's fine." Mm-hmm. I said Naples. It stops there. <laughs> That's the that's the line. I drew it like right here. <laughs> and Naples is also where Lucrezia Borgia's uh, last latest husband came from. I believe he was like a was he a Nepalese prince? Mm-hmm. How do you say it? Nepalese? Okay. What was his name? Armando. Or something? Oh, you're killing me. Yeah, I think it's Armand. One of those names. So many names of people. God, that portrait of her is hideous. Ouch. (laughs) But it's like always, you know, everybody else tries to portray her pretty, pretty. but that portrait is very dumpy. Is that the right? No, that's not the right one. I guess the portrait portrays her in like Renaissance beauty. (laughs) Alfonso. That's what his name is. Alfonso. Of Aragon. Let's go back to this portrait that you're trashing of this this poor woman. Oh, that's the one from the show, and it looks like a Renaissance painting. Well, it's that is a photograph. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, that's yeah. not the best portrait of her. She and has her hair jowls. Looks, that doesn't even look like her, to be honest, because usually she's depicted like that or like that. Mm-hmm. See, that's much prettier. Might not Ouch. be like, might not be proportionate. No, and I mean like, you know, <laughs> usually when you had your portrait done, it like was an idealized form of yourself. painter hated her in that. She was like, I'm going to shit all over your historical public image. <laughs> People are going to think that you were terrible looking. It's going to go down for centuries. It's going to be great. And it's like they were too stupid. What a beautiful portrait of my of my only daughter here. <laughs> and it's like, you love it, don't you? She I, was his only daughter. I, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to... <laughs> Assassin's Creed. <laughs> yes. Let's get back to it. Okay, so Ezio and Bart return to the barracks, and Ezio relays his plan. Bart says, uh, so you have a plan. And Ezio says, once inside, your men can overpower the camp's patrols, correct? And Bart says, yes, but... And Ezio says, especially if the patrols are taken completely by surprise? And Bart says, ma certo, of course. Ezio says, then we need to liberate several suits of French armor. At dawn, we are going to walk right in. And Bart says, Ha! Ezio, Adatore, you are truly a man after my own heart. Magnifico. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> What's stupid? We're just going to wear this armor and walk right in. No one's going to be wary of this. <laughs> Why these three unreported French soldiers are just wandering in in the morning? Well, that's not actually what the plan is, but that it's kind of, it kind of is, but we'll elaborate more. Ezio says, I will get the armor. And Bart says, my troops will gather it for, from the dead. We will then depart uh, from the north so as not to arouse suspicion. And Ezio, make sure to kill them without a fight. The armor has to stay clean. The mission is called French Kiss. Mm. Orchestrate the plan to fool Baron de Valois by assassinating 20 French soldiers in the Roman ruins, allowing Bartolomeo's men to steal their armor. For full sync, do not be detected. I guess correspondence being what it was, if you dispatch all of the messengers before they can get word back to headquarters saying our men are being killed and their suits are being looted, then it can succeed. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just have to kind of give a lot of leeway to that. Now, there are five red target symbols on the mini-map, indicating the French encampments among the Roman ruins. Sneak into each encampment and dispatch the soldiers either by hand or use your recruits to do it for you, um, the assassin recruits. Once 20 of them are dead, meet Bark... Meet Bark, meet Bart and his troops near the northern. <laughs> Call him Bark. <laughs> what? Call him Bark. Uh, the northern Roman wall in the campaign district. As Ezio arrives, Bartolomeo's men are already in French armor and they are adjusting their fittings for movability. I normally call him Bart because it's shorter than trying to say Bartolomeo mm. all the time. But that's a five-syllable name. That's too Bartolomeo. Much. Isn't it? Five, yeah. Yep. And uh, so Bart says to his men, Bring me a suit of that perverted armor. And Ezio puts a hand on his shoulder to stop him. He says, You are not wearing one. And Bart says, What? Ezio says, it is part of the plan. You surrendered to us. We are bringing you to the Baron. And Ed, uh, Bart says, ah, yes. Then what? Ezio says, your men attack on my signal. Bart says, bene. Go change into costume. Dawn approaches. To his men, he says, get into formation. Mission. Ladies. <laughs> <laughs> the mission is... Uh, called Trojan Horse. Reach the I was French... about to say, like, they're going to freaking Trojan Horse this, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. 
So, reached the French fortress at Castra Pretoria. What was the... Sorry, it just reminded me of the uh, whole... One of my favorite things. I'll talk about it after. Um, reached the French fortress at Castra Pretoria before sunrise while leading the disguised mercenaries. Kill any French troops at the checkpoints along the way before they raise the alarm. For full sync, do not lose any health squares. Ezio, dressed as the lieutenant, leads his troop along the route to the castle. Just as a mission description says, the French soldiers are set up at checkpoints along the route. Route is the way. I'm just going to pronounce the word route. Right. I'm not going to try to pronounce it any other way from now on. You must dispatch every single one because their suspicion is aroused once they start to question your troops or once you get anywhere near them. Is it the Italian accents? It's the Italian accents. Probably the fact that they're not wearing... They can't speak French. <laughs> I was going to say, they're not wearing helmets, and I almost said they're not wearing berets. And I was like, well, that's <laughs> obnoxious. <laughs> they're not wearing helmets? No. Wow. Okay. They're wearing the... I thought they were, like, wearing full body armor. I'm like, okay, that kind of makes sense, because you're really obscured, and you can't really recognize they're the They're wearing by full their body eyes. armor, except their heads. It's on their heads. They have the headband wrapped around that, in all the games, indicates you are of the mercenary guild. Only mercenaries have a headband wrapped around their head. <sighs> So, yeah. Masters of Disguise. See, this was mm-hmm. a brilliant plan until you told me that, and now it's... God. <laughs> so the lead mercenary says, We must follow the patrol route. We cannot deviate, or the Duke's men will know something is wrong. Question, mm-hmm. who is the Duke? I'm guessing this it's is... It's not D-U-K-E, it's D-U-C, apostrophe S. That's an abbreviation. Yeah. Uh, uh, Duke, um, that's how you say it in French. Does that mean general? No, it means like an actual, like, I think. So who the fuck is the Duke? Because if you look at, like, the Duke du Barry, I believe it's spelled D-U-C, Duke. I know, but it's like, was that just a really bad typo or something? Because there's no Duke. Oh, maybe. Yeah, because Duke is Duke in French. Yeah, I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing the, the Duke has nothing to do with this shit. But. Should not be. So they're up. saying this, Ar- uh, the, sorry, Augustino? No, no, sorry, Octavio. O- o- Octavio is a duke now? Maybe. I guess he's the cousin of the king. Yeah, I guess that tracks. Whatever. Yeah, he would have a title. This is the first time they've called him the duke. You'd think he would use that more. But I guess he wants to be the general. Yeah. Well, according to the Assassin's Creed wiki, he is a baron. Yeah, so he's not a duke. Okay. Anywho, is it... <laughs> Bart whispers into Ezio's ear, The Baron thinks Cesare will allow the French to rule Italy. He is so blinded by the trickle of royalty in his blood that lazy inbred can't see the battlefield. Whatever the French may think, Cesare intends to be king. So a 30-second timer starts off, telling you to dispatch uh, three more guards at the next roadblock before they have a chance to find you out. Okay, it does say one of Bartholomew's men referred to Octavian as Duke, which is French form of Duke, though he is actually a baron in general, according to the trivia. Mm-hmm. For <laughs> Just trying to do some damage control. Uh, we know what we said, but we apologize. Well, it says uh, he's never referred to it by his real name when a character mentions him. It was only his title. Or by his last name, the Baron, the Duke, the Baron de Valois, Valois. None of the characters refer to him as his full name, just the database entry it refers to him as Octavian de Valois. Ah, okay. Okay. So, Bart says, your plan is brillante, but I don't like, (laughs) but I don't like using this kind of trick. I believe in a fair fight, in fair fighting, may the best man win. Ezio says, Cesare and the Baron seem to have a different style. And Bart says, there will come a day in which men no longer cheat each other. And on that day, we will see what mankind is truly capable of. Ezio says, I've heard that before. And Bart says, It is something your father once wrote. They approach the next checkpoint and have to dispatch another set of guards. Then there is a brief interval before the last checkpoint is reached. From there, they approach the gates of the Castra. Ezio walks up to the gates, holding Bartolomeo in restraints. 
The costra we're referring to is the costra pretori, pretoria, which is the house of the pretori, Praetorian guard from Roman era. And I believe you have notes on oh, there. Okay. So the Castra Pretoria, like you said, is the Praetorian Guard. It's their barracks. Um, the, so the Praetorian Guard are an elite group of soldiers. They actually predate the emperors of Rome, but even when the first emperors took leadership, the guards were swiftly transitioned into more of a private army for the emperor. Um, but they also held a lot of political power in the city of Rome because they're known for basically choosing who becomes the next emperor and taking out emperors that they do not agree with or they think are a big issue for them. So they elect emperors, or they kill... They don't elect the emperor, but you definitely have to have, like, their seal of approval if you are going to declare yourself as emperor. Like, uh, I believe, like, like, one of the theories is, like, when... uh, No. (laughs) They're they're not part of Congress, though they do have seats in the different uh, political um, congresses of... um, ancient Rome, but so basically, if you wanted to become emperor, you just kind of had to get, like, the approval of the Praetorian Guard, so usually you try to schmooze them, or you at least meet with their leader before you declare yourself as emperor, because what the Praetorian Guard can do is literally take you out, and that's what they did to, like, Caligula, um, yeah. like, they're known for killing him, because he was just getting way too out of control, not just him, yeah. but his his uh, child as well, just to, like, wipe out that issue, <laughs> and be like, this next dude, uh, like, uh, Claudius, is now about. emperor because we declare it so. And everyone's like, okay, the Praetorian Guard says he's an emperor, so uh, he's but emperor. It's like, he's like trying to go. It's like trying to walk into like up to the Vikings and everything. Here, I brought you beer and like chocolates and stuff like that. Won't kill me later. And like, uh, <laughs> it's like it was. I would like to be It was emperor. on my mind, but you know. I would you like know, to be emperor, but is that okay with you? It. Are y'all good with that? I'll get you like these things. Oh, okay, yeah, you seem cool. You can be emperor now. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm sure that's later. how the conversation it's went. like, hmm, I'm not going to say that. You Maybe know. not. <laughs> just, you know, just don't, like, declare, like, your horse, like, a politician or anything like that, you know, and you're good. <laughs> and they still hold, like, reserve the option to, like, kill you later. And it's like, can you promise not to kill me later? And I'm like, uh... Think about it. Think Sharpening about your it. swords uh-huh. in the background. <laughs> But yeah, um, but yeah, the Praetorian Guard was known for being so powerful that not only did you basically have to seek their approval for all of these things, but even, uh, what was it, uh, Constantine um, disbanded them because he was sick and tired of them and their influences. Well, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's like if they're holding a sword to your neck like the entire time you're well, ruling. Well, Constantine like, is just, pretty far down the chain of, of emperors, so they were in I'm pretty sure, like, time. yeah. By the time it gets to him, he's like, why do we even have them anymore? Like, We Jesus. should just kill them. <laughs> or at least remove them. Did you hear him? He just said he would kill me. Why are they still here? Oh, I'm <laughs> so happy because it's the month of March and my favorite assassination is coming. Oh, yeah. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's almost oh my gosh. that time. Well, I, I thought we were saying, we were, we were toying with the notion of doing a special episode on that day, but. We mm, could. I guess. Beware the Ides of March. That's uh, not next week, but the week after, I think. I don't know if I work on that day. The Ides is the 15th, in case you're, you're not familiar with what I'm referring to. But we should probably continue our story. Yeah, we should probably... At the two-hour mark. Yeah. <laughs> I have some way to be... Oh, gosh. So, as he approaches the gate with Bartolomeo in tow, the French watchman says, Que venez-vous faire faire ici? Que venez-vous faire ici? Declare yourself. Ezio says, Mes soldats conduisent le capitane uh, italien et son excellence le baron. Il veut se rendre. My soldiers are taking the Italian captain to His Excellency the Baron. He wants to surrender. And the watchman says, What part of France are you from? And Ezio stops and thinks for a moment. He's like, Montreal. What? <laughs> Montreal. Montreal. <laughs> but he says it, you know, in that way where you just rush the word out. So, 
The watchman says, calling to his men, Open the gates! And Bartolomeo whispers to Ezio, You speak French? Like, I didn't know you speak French. And Ezio says, There were a couple of French girls in Firenze. <laughs> Like, of course Ezio would say something. Ezio is probably just trying to keep his cool. I'm sure, like, his mother made him learn French or Ezio's something Ezio's like just that. like, omelette du fromage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, Bartolom, uh, no, that's already past that. As they enter the gates, the French soldiers are shouting French jeers at Bartolomeo, such as, Chien de Italian. Do you know what that means? Chien de Italia. Mm-mm. Italian dog. Ouch. Mm-hmm. And regardez uh, le regardez le uh, il de ce est. Uh, look at him. He is ashamed of what he is. And uh, in the book, Ezio is only glad that Bartolomeo can't understand a word of it. <laughs> yeah. You know his temper. They immediately start shit talking back. <laughs> Like for this to go smoothly, I'm glad they just keep talking in French. Finally, they approach the general's quarters. Valois carries Pantasilia. General de Aviano, it seems that you have seen the light. Uh, Bartolomeo says, Enough of your crap. Release my wife. Valois says, Such entitlement from a man who was born with nothing to his name. Bart says, Mine's worth his currency, unlike yours, which is counterfeit. Valois says, how dare you? Bart says, you think that commanding an army grants you nobility? Nobility comes from fighting besides your soldiers, not kidnapping a woman to cheat your way out of battle. Why don't you grow a pair and release my wife? Valois says, you savages never learn. He takes out his flintlock pistol and points it at Pentacelia's head. And Ezio fires off his hidden pistol to create a distraction, and the frightened Baron retreats into the fortress with Pentacelia. I don't think that was the best idea. Several things went wrong with that. I mean, Bartolomeo shut like if Bartolomeo like I think in the book they kind of toured this notion. It's like Ezio's right there next to him, and he's pretending to be. Bartolomeo, and he could just kick him to make him shut up so he doesn't say anything mm-hmm. stupid to Which jeopardize Which he probably should, this. to be honest. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Better forgiveness than permission. Just you know, <laughs> shut up, you Italian. <laughs> be quiet. And then, you know, and then get Pantasili to safety and then spring the trap, but nope. So, after Ezio and the mercenaries take down the Baron's three bodyguards, blocking their way, Bartolomeo flies into a panic. Bart says, Ezio, you have to save my wife. Take to the rooftops. Once again, it's like, Ezio, please clean up my mess. <laughs> Not please. Go, clean up my mess. Mission is called Au revoir. Uh, overtake the Baron de Valois and assassinate him. For full sync, finish the mission in less than five minutes. So, to enter the Baron's quarters at the back of the fortress, Ezio must dispatch four guards at the next gate, and then raise it. Once he enters, he sees the Baron carrying off Pantasilia, but the Baron sees him too, and fires his flintlock at him, which misses, but Ezio dies for cover, not wanting to be seen again. So, there... Once past this gate, there's like a miniature fortress structure uh, that might have served as a training hall at some point. The Baron has retreated there, and he has reloaded his flintlock and has it aimed at the back of Penticilia's head. Make your way to him without being noticed by the guards, or he will shoot her in the head, and you will be desynced. Santos X07 has his recruits available to do his dirty work, with the guards patrolling the area. Santos X07 is the uh, game player whose gameplay I'm watching. And then uh, once he has those guards taken out with the assassin recruits, he gains the rooftop from the castle and Ariel assassinates De Valois. Sorry, I kind of ran that out there out of monotone. But he, he basically uh, sends out the recruits, takes out the guards that are patrolling the rooftops and every square inch of this area, 
and then he goes and gets on the roof of the fortress-like structure, and then from there, Valois is not looking up, he's looking everywhere but up, so you can aerial assassinate him. Um, I, however, remember playing this, and on several several times, I thought I was being stealthy enough, and I didn't have any recruits available to go and dispatch these guys, so I tried to sneak up and kill them, and I would kill one and get noticed by another, and then repeatedly I watched Pantasilia's brains get blown out. I mean, not literally, it wasn't, they didn't make the animation as visceral. You see gun smoke and she falls down. So mm-hmm. otherwise I probably would have been traumatized for but life. still. Like on a repeated basis. So yeah, it's, it's quite traumatic even still. So, but we've successfully assassinated Baron de Valois. On our first attempt. <laughs> yeah. And we get the deathbed, uh, I would hope so, because I don't think she has many brains left. Like, the, <laughs> um, the deathbed confessional sequence. Valois says, I only wanted respect. Ezio says, respect is earned and not inherited or purchased. Valois says, perhaps you are right. I need more time. And Ezio says, que tu sia body nella morte. May you be equal in death. Requiescat in pace. So once this deathbed confessional sequence is finished, Pantasilia just... Uh, Ezio frees Pantasilia just as Bartolomeo rushes in to see her. Bart says, Pantasilia! He runs to her, and then before embracing her, looks at her sternly. Don't ever disappear again. I was lost without you, he says more adoringly. Pantasilia says, Really? But you rescued me. And Bart says, Ezio came up with the brilliant plan. Ezio says, I did not. It was all your husband's idea. More for Bart's benefit than for Pantasilia's. Mm -hmm. This has to kind of rebuild his ego. Mm -hmm. Bart says, it was. And Pantasilia says, you are my prince. And she embraces him. And Bart's smiling, saying, now I better earn that title. Pantasilia says, looking into his eyes, you will, and to Ezio, uh, she says, thank you, and she leaves. Bartolomeo says nothing, just goes up and gives Ezio a solemn pat on the shoulder, and then he walks off after his wife. So now the checkpoint is reached, and sequence six is complete. The trophy earned on the PlayStation says, forget Paris, and we are done. That was sequence five and six. We've taken out two of Cesare's main players. All that's left is pretty much to go after him and the rest of the Borgias. So that's what we'll be working on next episode. Um, Thank you guys for listening. Uh, I don't really have anything else to mention or shout out. Um, I think we should do at least a mini episode for the 15th. Yeah, that we might come up with something for for that. Like, yeah, do like a mini sode for basically talk about Julius Caesar on the Ides of March, as he was killed on the Ides of March. So, um, keep an Which ear is out the for 15th that. Fifteenth of March. Fifteenth <laughs> of March. So keep an ear out for that. We don't have much time to prepare for that, but I guess we can do it. Um, it can be a mini one if we need to. Yeah. Uh, oh, we reached 50 followers on Twitter, so thank you guys. I put a little note there. Um, I'll still keep going with um, little visual diaries and everything. I'll send you guys, uh, I might post pictures, but I'll try to get another graph out there that's showing the relation charts and how, first of all, I need to do one for the entire Borgia family. Not the entire one, but the ones that are in the game. And then I need to uh, put like all of the enemy targets into one layout for Brotherhood, so... We'll be working on that, and I'll get that out as soon as I can. Other than that, there's not much else to cover. Uh, Thank you guys for listening. And remember, if your eagle vision is on the fritz again... It's fine. Healthy even. Just relax. You're just experiencing... The bleeding effect. effect.